Thanks very much, and thanks for um, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I guess I could say a couple of things. If I start with this, um, for I think about 18 years, I've been basing the abstraction I've been making on music. And so this, the particular piece of music behind this uh, painting is a, a George Harrison composition. Um, I don't know, it might, have been, it might be the, the times, but earlier in the year, and uh, I found myself listening to All Things Must Pass, the George Harrison album over and over because I kind of seemed to need some peace in my life and that seemed to be uh, George Harrison was you know the spiritual Beatle and um, someone I you know my favorite Beatle and um, so I was listening to this album a lot I had this I had this big canvas and, and one of the compositions seemed to make sense for me to put onto this canvas um, if you don't know if I can just tell you how that that album was made with uh, Phil Spector as the producer and Phil Spector had a musical production style called, uh, that became uh, known as, if, if you don't know, it's called the wall of sound. He conceived the wall of sound. So obviously there's a visual pun there between uh, my use of music and, and uh, abstraction and this sort of multi-layered sort of interface, the wall of sound that, um, uh, and, in, and in, in particular, the song Wah Wah was uh, a song that um, George Harrison went and wrote in response to um, you can see it in the end of the uh, documentary uh, called Let It Be on the Beatles, towards the end of the Beatles. Uh, they're having a there's a particular scene in there where they're having a bad day in the studio. No one's getting along. The Beatles are nearly broken up. Um, one of the things that happened was that um, Paul McCartney gave George Harrison a wah-wah pedal, which is a special effects pedal. And uh, he went home and wrote a song and the line, you know, the line of which is, I don't need no wah-wah, which is, you know, George Harrison's, I mean, George Harrison being one of the, be you know, the best guitarists in the world, he didn't need no special effects. And, and so th there's, some, there's, some, there's some attitude in there that, that I relate to in George Harrison and, and sort of there's some puns going on back and forth and perhaps something self-effacing in the way that I think about that and use that, that music. Um, and sort of the, the sort of exercise in futility that making a, a visual work out of sound as a source or a written score is kind of, it sort of, it kind of settles where I like to work and it suits me to do that. And so that's where this particular painting came from. Uh, there's another idea that, that is also at work here, which is the title of the show itself and, and given to the, the, how the whole suite of paintings came out. Um, there's a, the show, so the exhibition, exhibit and the suite of paintings is, is called Blow Up. And that's also based on a, um, something from the 60s, which is uh, a film that I'm fascinated with by Michelangelo Antonioni called Blow Up. Um, it came out in 1966 and, and it, has a, um, it has a protagonist who I, I hate to say identify with him on lots of different ways, but in, in certain ways and, and the film itself was sort of in some ways in criticism it was lost on uh, amid a sensation that uh, there was a there was some brief nudity and in the 60s there was a, so there was a scandal surrounded uh, surrounded the film which to me obscured some of the some of the better parts of it that I relate to as an artist and identify with the protagonist in the, in the movie because he uh, he's what he does is he, he he's photog he's photographing in a park and as the movie unfolds he seems to see as he develops his work he seems to think he's seen something and, and, and it's the evidence of a crime or a murder and so he pursues and goes further into his work and in this exercise in this pursuit he becomes he's, he's, he's sort of here he is living in swing in london in the 60s and he's a fashion photographer and he's an extreme and, and with regard to his life and his, his vocation he's extremely jaded and and his attitude and how life is uh, how he reacts to life is one thing and the way he exists in the world is one thing um, but the way he exists in relation to his work and how his work generates more work and he goes deeper into it and the, and and as an artist in the film he's only never more alive than when he's going further into his work and creating more work and so somewhere in there there's there's a, a there's something that I relate to as a painter uh, and that's so all of these paintings are generated from this particular work I made the big one and then I made the the medium ones by zooming into a section and blowing them up and 
the smaller ones by going even further into a smaller section and blowing them up even more. So as you see, you can see if you find the black bands here, they, in the medium paintings, the, that band becomes twice as wide. And then in the even smaller paintings, they become even wider. So, so there's a sort of um, a reverse relationship. The, the larger the painting, the smaller the bands, and the, the smaller the frame, the larger the bands. But they all are generated by the one work. And so, I, uh, so this tally having such a great, lovely big space and big storage, more room than I've got back in the studio, I could ship this to Dallas and then she could store it because I know she's got the room. And that's, <laughs> that's really why I did it. No, no but um, this exhibit, this space, I rarely get to exhibit in such a big space and it, it is a really wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. And um, this space was perfect for this show and this suite of work. So, so it was, it was been an exciting body of work for me to make and um, Without rambling on too much and going on too long, um, that I think is, I think that essentially sums it up. Um, I did, you know, I, I have a Texas connection, a couple of Texas connections. One, in fact, I talked to Dave Hickey. Many of you, some of you may have heard of Dave Hickey being from Texas. And he's, he, uh, he told me that, uh, of all things, that his college girlfriend married the star of Blow Up. So I had no idea. Uh, David Hemmings, David, Dave Hickey's college girlfriend, ran off with David Hemmings. So I, <laughs> the connection, I, you know. And now, that, that came from Dave Hickey. So that might be a little mytho mythological. I don't know. It might be true. But, um, but I don't know. It's, you, can't, you can't make that up. So I, I imagine uh, there's some truth to it. Um, and uh, this, is, this is literally 20 years since my first show. My first solo show in the States was at Angstrom Gallery here in Dallas in 98. It was actually sort of joint. There was two galleries in Angstrom and Yek, another Las Vegas, via Singapore, uh, was showing there. Uh, we had just done a show in um, Houston called Ultra Lounge, which Dave Hickey curated. Then we came over here and we had our solo shows in Angstrom Gallery. So. I've loved, uh, and, and I currently co-work with Sean Slattery, who was working in the gallery that day, at that time when I first came here and was one of Vernon, Vernon Fisher's uh, students. And today we're uh, the co-advanced. I'll say that in advanced in front of Vernon, because we're, you know. Um, but we're in Las Vegas, and we both teach uh, in the painting department at UNLV now, which is where we went and did our, uh, our, uh, our graduate studies, so. Yeah. Yeah. I hope Tally will not mind me asking you this question. Yeah. Did you care to say, what was the Dallas Gallery that gave you your first show? It was Angstrom Gallery. Angstrom, Angstrom Gallery. David Quadrini was the owner. And, uh, 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 and no, it was wonderful. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a Neiman Marcus in Las Vegas, and um, they, they remodeled, and a lot of us Las Vegas artists ended up there through Ken Downing and um, the, the, the connection to Dallas and Neiman Marcus. Here. Yeah. I'm just curious, like this beautiful work, how long does that take you to create? Uh, I worked on it on and off. Um, the painting, so maybe it's a week or two of painting, but um, they, they all sort of evolve over time. But I mean, if you, if you compressed it, it's a couple of weeks of painting. So, yeah. How do you translate music into visual music? Do you have some specific way you do it? And I realize yeah. that you take a, you, you work on it anyway. Yeah, so um, the question was how do I translate, you know, the basics of how I translate uh, a, a music into a visual pattern is that I work from the, from the written score um, number one, I, I use a written score. Sometimes um, with an assistant who's really good, you've got a perfect ear, we have to uh, 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 transcribe from ear, which is, I can't really do because I'm not a very good, um, not good at anything, um, you know, when it comes to music, playing it or anything. Um, but I have some, in a weird way, over the last 18 years, been at, be, sort of developed an ability to um, read a music score and see a pattern. So it's almost like I'm sort of educated, as a kind of educated um, synesthesia. 
but um, essentially the, the smaller the width uh, is the shorter the note, the wider the width is the longer a note is held. So this is the, so what's reflected in the width is a time sequence. So time being an important element to painting and abstraction and um, and then the colors start off uh, as I match a color key with the musical key. And so if I have a, um, there's a favorite painter of mine, Bridget Riley, used to is talk about paintings have a particular color energy. She likes to have a bias to her paintings, which to me is equivalent in music is a, the root and a, a root key or a note. So, um, so I have a color key in essence. Yeah. Impression. I can see the strong relationship in the music. I've seen Blow Up a lot of times. Yeah. Maybe, could you talk more about the relationship to Blow Up? Yeah, the relationship to Blow Up? Yeah. Um, again, it's a, it's a movie I've seen a lot. I, like I said, I, I relate a lot to the character. He's sort of at once jaded and at once alive. He's sort of like, he vacillates back and forth given the... I grew up in London too, so... Um, there's some elements of that being English, and um, uh, the main the main relationship for me is this idea of the correlation of a painter making work that, gen that that is the result of making more work. You make more make work, and it leads to more work. And um, in this work, I did it literally, where I went as as Hemmings did, and the character in Blow Up goes literally in, takes a photograph, goes further in, blows it up further. And I really like the idea of having a room where I could look. You, there's, there's some scenes in the film where you see he's developed this roll of film and the prints are ever larger around the room. And he's looking back and forth and he's trying to figure out the mystery uh, that he seems to think. The other thing about the film is that there are things he thinks he sees and he thinks he comes to know from exploring his work. But which at the end of the film is, I think is unresolved. You don't know whether he's seen them or whether, whether you've seen them or whether he has. And so this is, again, something I relate to as a painter. Um, it's, it's, this, it's, it's an ongoing investigation, painting being an ongoing investigation for me, which ever sort of leads to more work and more results and the end of which I never know, I'm never quite sure of. And I certainly don't know necessarily whether I know what I've seen or know what it means or not but it's it's this ongoing pursuit and that's what I relate to so have you always done this this style this is yeah I um <clears throat> in 98 when I had the first show here I was still a graduate student when I showed at Angstrom and they were sprayed striped paintings and actually some of the more minimal ones looked like the small ones in this show so yeah, I've been doing this. I've, I settled while I was in graduate school. I settled on the stripe as a vertical form, which just is a, a staple of a lot of abstract painters. Um, uh, and for some reason, I mean, here I am, 20 years later, still able to focus on uh, that restricted form and continue to get something out of it. Yes. So essentially, the, the left side of the painting would be the beginning of the song, and the right side would be the end of the song. Right. It's a note. Right. So, do you, um, is that just the melody? Or when you sit down with the score, or looking at the score, are you just taking into account the, the notes of the melody? Or do you have a different way that you represent um, like chords or like staccato or legato? Yes, things? yeah. So, one of the, and there's the, the, the other, Tally mentioned there's a three dimensional sculpture here which again has some three-dimensional dynamics, which are, they are the result of the different heights of the three-dimensional forms are the result of reading dynamics and coming up with a visual interpretation for them. Um, so, so yeah, there are, there are different ways I look at um, slow, fast, those different ideas, and I can, and you could obviously vary the, the length of the width of things and change the character of, um, different areas according to dynamics suggested by the written score, which I do that. Um, then again, once I've got a score as a sketch, it's sort of, like I said, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not lost on me that there's an exercise in futility in trying to make a visual representation of, so it's not, there's not an equivalent when I make a, a, it's just that I use the geometry and the math of the relationship between notes and timing in music. 
to create the underpinnings of a geometric uh, painting. And then there are things after that, there, for me, there are things that I can do as a painter, which are essentially traditional paintings. So uh, the, the greys relate to um, you know, being a fan of someone like Mirandi. So Mirandi is an incredible painter who I'm a big fan of, but what he, and of course what he does with colour is turn the volume all the way down. And so there is some green, I think, in, in, in these two grey grisaille paintings, but they are like volume almost down to zero because quite often I do, and since the beginning I did loud paintings. I typically did loud. I like to do loud. That began, it's always been sort of rock and roll aesthetic and psychedelics and things like that. But nowadays I'll do things that, um, that are more rooted in. So there's, a, there's a, a sort of definite hybrid between painting and attitude towards music. How many times do you have to listen to the song? Like, like thousands? Like, how does that... Well, I mean, I don't necessarily... Since I'm not actually trying to capture the song itself, I'm using the, the, just the, the information. Yeah. So it's kind of like I'm looking for data or information to make a painting out of, which has more feeling than, than the sort of pure sort of um, yeah. geometry without any heart to it. You know what I mean? So. So there is some, some connection to it for me.